Skin is something we're all interested in. Our next speaker is a skin expert, ladies and gentlemen. Please give a big welcome to Rosemary Nixon. He's a bit of a hard act to follow, isn't he? Um, I'm a dermatologist. My main interest is uh, skin allergies, really, people who get rashes, uh, particularly uh, at work. So what I've talked about today is really a bit outside my, um, my comfort zone, but I've tried to look at areas of dermatology um, that I think might appeal to the sceptics. So I'm going to, the problem with some of these areas is in order to, to explain why some of the claims that cosmetic companies and others make uh, are fallacious is that we actually have to know something about the skin. So I have to do a bit boring, um, really medical student or very early in dermatology training, you have to read these pretty dry and boring books about the skin. So I've got to explain how the skin works to a certain extent. Most of us actually don't know anything about the skin until it, it trips up. And then we find out that, oh, that's how it works, because we can see the evidence of it not working. I'm going to, that's going to bring me into a bit about acne and moisturisers and skin ageing, which I guess is the, the stuff that we see in these glossy magazines and following very much from uh, what Steve said before. Uh, that leads us into... Uh, something of interest to myself in the, the sun protection department. Some dermatology myths, that's when I asked my colleagues what they thought the sceptics needed to know, uh, what urban myths about dermatology are out there. And fairly sobering data about how, uh, where our Medicare money is going. Um, in response to the previous question, the government doesn't fund any of those uh, alternative health practitioners, they do fund at the moment uh, doctors, all types, uh, optometrists who got in early to Medicare, and I think now psychologists, uh, but Steve may like to correct me if there are, there are more groups. Obviously to get on Medicare, it's been a great thing for those practitioners. So the skin's obviously very important, I would say that, I'm a dermatologist. Um, we hear that it's the largest organ in the body, whatever that means. Uh, it's very large anyway, but the thing about how the skin works is that the function and the structure are very much linked together. And uh, I did mean to ask for a pointer, so if anyone's got one, uh, that would be good. Um, you can see that the top layer of the skin is the uh, epidermis, the bottom layer, the underneath layer is the dermis, and underneath there's fat. And there's all these structures that live in skin, so it makes a big difference to us whether they're in the top layer of the skin, the epidermis, or whether they're in the underneath layer. And how we diagnose skin rashes is all to do with actually where the pathology is happening. Is it on the top, is it the underneath, is it deeper to that? You can see that in the dermis, the underneath layer, are a lot of the important skin structures, oil glands, hair follicles, blood vessels. Um, we're, in, in my area of occupational dermatitis, we're pretty interested in the stratum corneum or what happens where it doesn't work. This is the, the sort of barrier function layer. This protects us against all these things out there from, from chemicals in various shapes and sizes, from various different types of bugs, uh, but it also holds us in. Uh, there's a great quote from Spike Milligan, Milligan that the, the skin is the thing that holds you in. We have this very sort of a waterproof structure. I mean, has ever, anyone ever thought the fact that, you know, our, our skin doesn't get wet and we don't get wet? It just has this great uh, bricks and mortar-like structure. As I say, you don't really think about these things until you see people whose skin's not working. So that really the epidermis, it's all about uh, the stratum corneum and obviously the, the pigmentation. Um, system which is at the bottom layer of the epidermis. But then there's this, all this other stuff that happens. We've got cells that are to do with allergy. We've got cells to do with making vitamin D. We've got things like shock absorption. Um, oh, great, thanks. Uh, blood vessels involved in uh, regulation, of, whoop, yep, regulation of temperature, uh, fat storage. All of these, are, you never thought about these things, did you? No. <laughs> Nerve endings, uh, sensation, lubrication from oil glands, which 
produce oil. Nails. Nails are very important for picking things up. Um, sweat, apocrine sweat glands. No doubt all those pheromones that we don't really know much about. And uh, who can argue with the psychosocial aspects of hair and nails? So just to wake you up, and I think you've done a great job getting back from lunch. Fantastic, really. Much better than a medical conference would. Um, just to show you what we deal with every day when your skin goes wrong. Um, and there are lots of really nasty conditions out there. This is pustular psoriasis. Um, that's an epidermal problem, so that's sort of scaly. But you can see those all pustular things too. That's very bad psoriasis of the hands. Uh, causes a, a lot of difficulty in just day-to-day -day life, just doing anything with your hands. Um, that was a hairdresser who's allergic to their dyes. I had to put an allergy there somewhere. Um, this is herpes simplex around the eye. So uh, an example of a viral infection that's quite uh, can be quite dangerous there because it, it can uh, spread. This is someone with, uh, again, psoriasis of the nails, quite marked nail dystrophy. And, and some of these uh, conditions can obviously have quite psychological effects. Um, people, even if they're doing a, a job like a bank teller with bad nails, does anyone ever go to the bank these days? But it's the classic job. If you've got bad nails, it's, uh, it's not very good. Blistering disorders. You said there's no dermatology emergencies. Um, I'll tell you, people with blisters on Christmas Day, uh, when um, the junction between the epidermis and the dermis breaks down, and uh, a lot of this is driven by the immune system, antibodies attack this junction and it creates these blisters, nasty conditions. Epidermolysis bullosa is a condition referred to as cotton wool babies. Again, these Kids or adults, if they survive, have a, a real structural problem the, the, between the epidermis and the dermis, so their skin is really, really fragile, a really nasty condition. And acne. Acne is a, a, a very common problem that we treat, and one that gives us enormous satisfaction uh, treating teenagers um, whom we know uh, are more likely to be unemployed if they have acne. So just leading me on to the pathogenesis of acne. Clean, clear skin, as easy as one, two, three. So what we see in our acne ads, very much cleansing the dirt. It's big, it's big in acne, cleansing the dirt. Toning and moisturising, cleansing the dirt. So we see there, cleanse dirt, oil and other impurities that can cause pimples with pump action self-foaming cleanser. So, to understand acne, we need to wonder why this slide's not working. It's perhaps just taking some time. Yep. Um, there are sort of four main factors. The first factor is uh, this abnormal uh, follicle pathology. That just means the, the uh, ducts leading to the oil gland and hair follicle just tend to get blocked up. That's often a bit genetic. Um, there's increased oil production, which happens as a result of the hormonal changes in adolescence. There are a few bacteria there, but at the end of the day, it's mainly skin inflammation. It's not so much about infection. So they're the causes of acne. And we have different types of acne lesions. We have, yeah, I told you this is going to get scientific, uh, closed comedones, blackheads, where am I there? Open comedones and pustules and nodules. Now, one of the sort of main urban myths in, in acne is that this blackhead, the closed comedone, that's dirt. It's not dirt, it's melanin. It's the pigment of the skin. Um, time after time, we see that people think of acne as a cleansing problem. You need to get rid of the dirt. There is no evidence that dirt, oil and other impurities need to be cleansed. We go back to the toners. There's no evidence that toners remove excess oil from deep inside the pores where pimples can start. In fact, we see the opposite. Toners can be very drying. They're sort of astringents. I mean, whoever, whoever started this cleanse, toner, moisturise stuff, not a dermatologist, uh, toners do nothing. They just dry your skin. Um, and that makes people want to use something even greasier, which for, uh, for teenagers can actually make their acne worse. 
Okay, spots tell your skin to act its age. Um, what I was interested in there were just these figures. I mean, don't you see these figures uh, all the time? Um, and the, the key is right over there. It's, um, I can't quite read it, but they asked a few people that use this and they created a percentage. And 82% people said that there was visible anti-perfection efficiency. 82% could be the same, 82% said tight and pores, refined skin texture, it goes on. We also have the great properties of acno zinc. I couldn't find anything about acno zinc in the medical literature. Uh, I should have done that and I could have read it. So, so these, these go on. Ocean pure skin. Whoever said the ocean was pure? <laughs> you can have a lot of fun with this. I mean, it's, I mean, you wouldn't normally even see these um, journals, but I got them from my teenage daughter. So acne, feel the clean, ocean pure, acne zinc. Dirt does not cause acne. Pores cannot tighten. Uh, many of these acne preparations claim immediate results. Um, the best thing that we have uh, are topical retinoids. They take at least four weeks. You also need to apply them all over the skin, not just on your pimples, because a lot of the effectiveness of the treatments is actually treating the ones that are going, going to come up next week. So, whoops. Let's go on to moisturisers. Oh. Okay, the last thing to talk about there uh, was moisturise to help prevent pimples. How? Oil-free moisturising helps protect skin so dirt can't get in. Back to dirt again. So what about moisturisers? Are they useful? Well, actually, there is a bit of evidence for moisturisers. Uh, basically, in the, in the setting of people who have uh, abnormal skin function, skin barrier function, and they're classically people with eczema, different forms of eczema, atopic eczema. Uh, they're also proven to be effective in one of the conditions that I see, people with irritant contact dermatitis of the hands. So that's your classic example is your hairdresser or your food handler or your nurse who just performs lots of wet work, wet, dry, wet, dry, very irritating to the skin. So moisturisers are very useful and they basically, uh, there's actually books written about moisturisers, but they basically uh, hydrate the the stratum corneum or work to put a layer, uh, impermeable layer, to decrease evaporative water loss from the skin. But there isn't any evidence that oil-free moisturising helps protect the skin so dirt can't get in. None at all. Moisturisers basically are to do with the epidermis and we talked about, I showed you that picture before of the epidermis and the dermis. Um, it's very important to understand the physiology. There are lots of molecules that if you put on their skin, there's just no way they can get in. They're too big. It's actually quite hard for molecules bigger than a molecular weight of about 500 to actually get in the skin. A few years ago, 10 years ago, we had all these collagen and elastin creams. These are big molecules. Uh, there's just no way these big molecules can insinuate themselves through the epidermis to get into the dermis, which is where the, the natural native collagen and elastin are. Again, you can write books on skin penetration, but it's quite a, a sophisticated and technical area. So there are no anti-aging effects of moisturisers uh, per se. Moisturisers have this moisturising effect on the stratum corneum. They do not uh, stop ageing. For substances to stop skin ageing, and, and there are some that perhaps try to say that they can, we need to have a dermal effect. There is some evidence that if we, if we do things to peel the skin, that may send a signal to the, those proteins, the collagen and elastin in the dermis. So there's a bit of evidence for things like topical retinoids, glycolic acids, alpha hydroxy acids. So if we go back to the structure, we've got the epidermis, the dermis and the fat. So it's the anti-aging effects are all in the dermis not just by putting something on the epidermis. Okay, so now we've got some moisturisers. 24-hour hydration, twice as soft, my skin glows with happiness. It's happy derm. With phytodorphins. Phytodorphins? I know there's a lot of eminent scientists in this room, but I hadn't heard of phytodorphins. 
and I couldn't find anything about phytodorphins. Okay, Elizabeth Arden. This one has down there advanced philagranol. Advanced philagranol. What's that? Well, I know about philagrin. It's a protein that's involved uh, in the formation of the, uh, the epidermis, binds keratin. And we know about it because if you're not very, uh, if your philagrin is a bit deficient, you get very scaly skin called ichthyosis. So it's a pretty important thing, but advanced philagranol. Again, no appearance, Your Worship, on the, uh, the search. What about this one? We've got melatogenine, melatogenine, and then we've got some vitamins. Anything for them? No. This one we've got traditional uh, West meets East fusion. No, nothing for that as well. Capture Total, the old Christian Dior, uh, visibly younger, had an index called Pixel Skin used. Uh, again, couldn't find anything, but they had done a survey. Uh, they had asked a few people, and uh, again, something like 90% of people claim. So it is pretty funny just going through these. It's a, it's a lot of fun. I like this one, virtual immunity. <laughs> Enjoy virtual immunity from the visible signs of aging. New, renutriv, ultimate lifting serum. Yeah, I like that one, virtual immunity. Why wait weeks for results? Get younger looking skin instantly. And how? Caffeine wakes up tired skin. <laughs> it's good, isn't it? A beauty breakthrough or six skin saviors. Okay, this one has got a number of things in it. Plankton. Plankton, white tea, vitamins, and beta hydroxy acids. And it costs $320. What do plankton, white tea, vitamins, and beta hydroxy acids do for the skin? Well, I did f find something about white tea. I was surprised that they had reported white tea and a number of other uh, agents um, where they supplemented a, a skin cells in a culture medium and actually showed that things happened. This was in a journal I've never heard of before called Biogerontology. So I was rather surprised about that. I mean, we are not talking double blind randomized controlled trials. We're just talking about one article in one journal where they used a nutrient combination of about six things. But even that surprised me. Plankton, there was nothing. And it turns out there's only one beta hydroxy acid, that's salicylic acid, which we've used for many years as a sort of a peeling agent. What about this one? Thyme perfection uh, contains grapeseed extract and super effective lycopene. Super effective lycopene, wow. Sounds good. Well, it turns out lycopene is that carotenoid, some of you probably know this, in tomato, it's an antioxidant. And there is actually some evidence for use as a systemic antioxidant, so it's eating it, that caused um, some improvement and photoprotection. So this was actually in some journals, which again surprised me. Again, uh, they were in supplements. The first one was a supplement. The second was the lycopene uh, uh, by itself. One is very dependent, um, it's, this is not my area of research, but one's very dependent uh, on these journal editors uh, not to be publishing stuff if they, if they don't think the trials are good. So uh, this was quite interesting to me. I mean, it raises lots of questions. I mean, how you do these studies? How, you, how do you show that people's wrinkles are better? But I must admit I was surprised to even find that. Plus some evidence for a, top, a, a topical photoprotective effect. But we're not talking about double-blind controlled trials. This one's got a few, and a uh, bit of pomegranate comes up there, rose hip somewhere, borage somewhere, and matsutake, which is a mushroom. What do these do for the skin? Well, no evidence for rose hip. Uh, has been used in osteoarthritis, borage. It's been used as a supplement in eczema. 
uh, squalene. I actually found that it induced skin wrinkling and caused uh, comedones, like acne. There is actually a bit of evidence for pomegranate in one skin model. So we're talking one paper, one skin model. It did something. Journal of Ethnopharmacol, that was a new one for me. And finally, uh, ginger, the dermo-relaxing properties of ginger. What does ginger do for the skin? Well, apparently it has been used in a mice model where they make skin tumours. It, it apparently uh, negates that, or it did in this one article. And in one use, study in rats, it did inhibit uh, wrinkle formation from ultraviolet light. So I was a little bit surprised to actually find that there was some evidence, uh, but the evidence is very much in vitro, and the evidence hasn't been shown in studies. And in fact, there was an editorial which isn't available online, which talks about eating ginger and rubbing on pomegranate. So perhaps I'm doing these people a disservice in perhaps some of their claims may eventually be shown to work, but at the moment there's no clinical trials. When we're in ageing though, we need to distinguish between photoaging and intrinsic ageing. And one of the things as dermatologists that we often uh, find interesting is to get people to look at their inner arms, or even better, their buttocks, and see how sun damaged that skin is, or how aged that skin is, to that skin. And you'll find that most of the ageing, and allegedly 90% has always been said, but I'm not sure how they got that figure, of skin ageing is caused by sun damage. And so really, in all of this, uh, I have to come back to giving you a lecture on sun prevention. There are many changes which you will well know between exposed skin and unexposed skin. Uh, you probably don't need me to list them all. We can see this histologically. Uh, this, it's not a great slide, I know, but this is sort of normal skin. Uh, but with the ageing skin, and I apologise for the different sort of stain, but all this blue stuff is uh, the change in the uh, dermal connective tissue that you see with ageing. So we see a lot of histological changes in ageing skin. So what can we do about skin ageing? Basically, the moisturisers don't work, it's sun protection. Sunscreens are effective in blocking UVB and to a certain extent UVA. Um, they act by either absorbing or reflecting ultraviolet light. One of the uh, things that people often get wrong about sunscreens is that they need to be applied, the chemical sunscreens need to be applied before you go out in the sun because they actually need to bind to the stratum corneum. So whenever I go to the beach and I see people putting on their sunscreen at the beach, I sort of have to almost shout out, you know, put your sunscreen on before you go to the beach if you want it to work. That's what, if dermis, I'll just go to the beach. I just want to share a study from my practice on um, understanding of the sun because sometimes uh, it's just interesting to find out what people out there know. So what I did was when people come f f with a concerns about a skin lesion and then we follow that with checking their skin, I said to them, when is the str sun strongest in Melbourne? I mean the most burning and you have to tell me a particular day. I'm doing a survey. And I asked the ethics people and they didn't say I had to do anything more than that. Um, the first group we now analysed was 435. I think we're now twice that. But only 25.3% named what I thought was the obvious theoretical answer, which is the uh, summer solstice. The majority of people in Melbourne named the time of the year where it's hottest late January, early February, kids go back to school. Um, the correct answer, it's theoretically uh, sounds right to say the summer solstice, it's probably about late December, depends on things like ozone. So we could show that a lot of people um, aren't, don't actually understand how to sun protect. And while this group who sun protect in who are more worried about January, February. Um, we weren't actually asking when there's sun protect, but this is to give us a little of their understanding. While we're not worried about this group, if you don't understand how it works, these are the people who are a bit vulnerable. Um, I'll come back to that. Looking at the results, we actually found males uh, did better than females, very significantly, that older people did better than younger people. And <laughs> it sounds like 
Sounds like I'm talking to the skeptics. And people with tertiary education were more knowledgeable than those with trades or secondary education. However, almost all women, and I feel like I should justify everything I say, but many men could re recall a sunburning experience in springtime when it was not particularly hot in Melbourne, I apologise, this is a Melbourne study, such as the Melbourne Cup Carnival. Oaks Day, last week, a couple of weeks ago, temperature was 21 degrees, very nice day, the UV index was 9, uh, which out of a scale of 16, so it's actually very high. And I, usually people come in the day after and they're sunburned. I didn't see anyone the week before. And then on Friday I saw someone whose partner got blisters from the sunburn. That's the Melbourne, this is a light relief at the Melbourne Cup. Um, discussion with educational authorities, they actually don't teach them. We couldn't, talking to the people who set the curricula, and there may be uh, knowledgeable people here, it doesn't sort of come up on the radar. The good news is, is I've sort of fed back to the Anti-Cancer Council and the, the, in some of their advertising, I think it's Skin Cancer Awareness Week just starting, they're now talking about sunscreen in September because basically in Melbourne uh, we now have some consensus from the Cancer Council that you need to sun protect when the UV index is 3 and that's from the 1st of September till the end of April. This was a very useful article. Um, by some more physicists, um, because it's actually uh, the corollary of this that vitamin D um, deficiency is actually a problem in the people who over sun protect, or the people with dark skins, or the people who cover up, uh, or the people in nursing homes. So it is actually important to understand how this works. And there is a huge variation between uh, Townsville and Hobart, as you, as you might expect. So my study. How long a period? Two minutes per what, per day, this was, sorry, this is one uh, medium erythemal dose is a unit, okay? So that unit took 22 minutes in Townsville in June compared to 150, uh, so it's like a unit. So this study is really just relevant to the cooler parts of Australia where people relate heat to, uh, to needing to sun protect. Mm. Uh, so as I mentioned, the Cancer Council now has guide guidelines it's my uh, slogan, it's, not, it's the date that burns you, not the temperature. Okay, so myths in dermatology. If it's natural, it must be good. Don't you love it? Um, this was just a case, so this is the sort of person that I see in my um, clinic at the Skin and Cancer Foundation. People with rashes, we've got to sort out a cause. This lady developed a severe rash with swelling on the fingers, so, so bad her rings needed to be cut off. Uh, it was quite severe. Um, unfortunately, we saw her after it settled down, and so we don't have photos. But her job was demonstrating this product uh, with essential oils, natural, must be good, to pharmacies, including this hand scrub. Um, she was pretty smart. She stopped using this, this scrub, and the rash got better. Now, in our clinic, we have all these chemicals that we can test. This is a form of testing, an allergy testing called patch testing. It's what dermatologists do. It's different from the prick testing, which is what the allergists and the uh, uh, respiratory doctors do. So we put tests on the back, and then we interpret when they come up with red marks, and the tests have to be sort of very fine-tuned as far as the concentration and the conditions go, so that it's a, a relevant result. She reacted to yang, lang oil, lime oil, tea tree oil, and her hand cream. So we made the diagnosis of allergic contact dermatitis uh, to the essential oils in her hand cream. We actually saw as part of a review study a couple of years later, and she was still in the same job, which surprised us. But she was able to do it by, by having these products and saying to the pharmacy assistant, try this on your skin, it's really good. <laughs> Here's another one. It's, it's natural. Okay, so natural. Um, um, a bit too hard to read, but their, their outline of eczema and dermatitis is all wrong. So we'll just go through this. Common ingredients causing health risks. Sodium lauryl sulfate is a prototype sort of skin irritant 
and there was a huge lobby. So it's used in studies where you want to induce irritation. So you use it uh, you know, experimentally as a skin irritant, but it's a surfactant that's present in a lot of products. Um, a lot of hype about that, and we don't have an opinion. But what I was concerned about here was the comments about the uh, uh, ethanolamines and particularly uh, the parabens, where they say their parabens causes allergic reactions. We do see uh, allergic reactions in our clinic to both of these products, so coconut diethanolamide, uh, we see a few, but the combined contact dermatitis and my clinic, the Occupational Dermatology Clinic at the Skin and Cancer Foundation in Carlton, about five years' worth of data, 5,000 patients, 37 reactions, so not a big problem to coconut diethanolamide. Eight patients reacted to parabens, so really not a big cause of allergy. These are relevant reactions. To put this in perspective, uh, more common relevant reactions we would get to be uh, things like nickel and chromate. So these percentages relate to people coming to the clinic. So these are a sort of a, it's a specialised clinic, so these are people who have a suspicion of some sort of skin reaction. Let me go through that. But we've also seen quite a few reactions to tea tree oil, despite the fact that it's natural, 31 reactions. And one of the important factors that seems to be relevant in tea tree oil dermatitis is because it's natural, people use it concentrated. They use it neat on broken skin, eczematous skin. Um, and that's a very good way of making yourself get allergic to things if you use concentrated things. Um, and it's quite ironic because tea tree oil actually is quite a good antiseptic at a concentration of 5%, but if you use it at 100%, you're much more likely to get allergic. We're actually waiting for that to be published. The other skin myths, uh, washing powder causes rashes. Nope. Um, the cosmetic labelling claims you could, again, do another talk on dermatology tested. I think Steve mentioned this clinically proven, hypoallergenic, uh, generally without, totally without substantiation. Our patients believe that diet and also exercise causes everything and fixes everything. You heard from Steve that he has the same problem with his patients. Aluminium causes deodorant allergic reactions. There's a lot of uh, anti-stuff about aluminium out there. My dad was a metallurgist, I have to stand up for him. Axillary rash is always, almost always uh, caused by fragrance in deodorant, not aluminium. So these are just things that bug us. Do you think you ever get something for free? One of my colleagues, this hasn't come out there, offering uh, an exercise bike with your skin rejuvenation program. Um, it's time to finish up, but I'm just going to show you some very, very quick data. David's just standing there. Um, given to me by a colleague of mine, Doug Zarnecki. And I thought that you people, the sort of people who might be interested in, well, over-servicing, uh, to put a point on it, there's been a proliferation of skin cancer clinics, particularly in the sunny areas of Australia, where these clinics bulk bill all the consultations and the procedures so the patients pay nothing. Do you ever get anything for nothing? Mm, don't know. So they've become quite popular because, the, to, put, uh, to put it quite simply, if you want to practice unethically in the area of cutting out skin lesions, um, there's really nothing to stop you because most Australians have a huge number of uh, predominantly benign skin lesions. But if you're using this to finance the way you practice, um, well, you'll see what the result has been to Medicare. So this is the number of skin biopsies, how this has risen uh, in an eight-year period from 150,000. I might have mixed the, the noughts there. Um, so we've had this uh, six-fold rise uh, in about eight years, uh, particularly uh, New South Wales and Queensland. If you look at the same area in... Um, West Australia, South Australia, New South Wales. So we look at latitude because the amount of sun people get at latitude is sort of similar. Uh, we can see that biopsies per capita far more uh, common in New South Wales. Uh, the other thing that we suspect happens in these clinics is that people, rather than having their skin cancers cut out simply, have them cut out in a very uh, complicated way which attracts more money from the government. That's called a skin flap. Uh, there's no definition of this. So if you look at what Medicare's paid for skin flaps, 
it's almost three times as much uh, in an eight-year period. I'm almost finished. Similarly, we can see that this has increased uh, to much more in New South Wales and Queensland, where there's been a proliferation of these clinics as compared to Victoria. Uh, again, that's reflected in these use of this item number in Victoria as compared to the others. Um, how many benign lesions should you take out for one malignant lesion? That's, this is quite important because you've obviously got to take out a few benign ones, otherwise you might not be picking up all the malignant ones. Um, in Queensland, it used to be eight benign ones, eight moles, so this is moles to melanomas. Now it's 29 to one. I went to a talk last week, our resident expert in, in Melbourne, his ratio is 0.8 to one. Data removed from all Australians, you can see that there has been a fair increase uh, in the removal of benign lesions over this time. I'm not sure about 1999. So with that, I'll leave it to you. I hope this has been of interest to you. Thanks very much. Question for Rosemary, um, just uh, this way. Yep. Um, you had the little thing at the end um, about your taxes at work and removal of uh, melanomas, benign and malignant. I was wondering if you had any figures on the opposite side of that of um, more complicated, um, left untreated, whether it was because they were removing so many more um, lesions that it was actually lowering the rate of more serious cancers or making no difference at all? Yeah, good point. I think that would be good to have that data in parallel to, to look at how many skin cancers uh, are being diagnosed. I, I haven't seen the latest trends. There's been a feeling that, that there may be a levelling off in the rate of skin cancer, but it's... Um, I'm not really up with that data. I mean, we, what we're seeing now is that the young, younger people are getting the skin cancer message a bit better, and that's starting to be reflected in some of the skin cancer rates, but, um, but I don't really have those figures up to date. So I think that's a reasonable point. However, there's always a however, I think um, the, probably the best slide, and I know I present them very fast, and I'm certainly not saying that all skin cancer clinics are bad because I'm sure a lot of them are doing a very good job. But I think the data just shows you that there are a lot more excisions uh, of benign lesions than there used to be. And I think that that ratio of benign to malignant is very telling. So remember in Queensland it was one to eight to one to, to 30. And it just is a, an area that anyone who wants to be unscrupulous can just say to someone who um, that all these spots need to be removed and they come back next week and they say, oh, good news, you're not going to die, they're all benign. And the patient in that situation has really got no idea that they've been uh, conned, or nor has Mr Howard, who's paid for it. Quick question for Rosemary. I've heard of black tea and green tea, but what's white tea and where do I get hold of some? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying it's proven yet, Rosemary, so you don't do anything that's not proven. I don't know. <laughs> uh, question from John. Uh, yes, um, my question is directed to Rosemary. Um, you, you, know, you did touch very briefly on this, but I'm just wondering if you could go into it in a little bit more detail, if you could. Uh, over, over recent times, there's been claims from some people and some groups about the harmful effects of sodium laurel sulfate in um, skin care products, some even um, making links with cancer. Uh, is there any evidence to support uh, these um, dangerous effects of sodium lauryl sulfate or, um, or is there other views about um, the real effects of it, in your view? I, from my point of view, I know there's a, a lobby, there's no doubt many websites and there's people who scrutinise all the ingredients of their detergents and don't buy the one with sodium lauryl sulfate. I'm not aware of any uh, reasonable research which backs those claims. It's an irritant, it's a skin irritant, that's what it's meant to do, it's a surfactant. And um, where it got this, there must have been something that led to this terrible reputation it's got, but it's not based on anything that I know as being reasonable. Mr. 
Rice. Uh, question for Rosemary, for the dummies like me. You said the skin products had been tested on skin model and mouse model. Uh, I have no idea what that is. Oh, this is really quite a complex area to try, and to try to look at all these, trawl through all these publications and try and work out what, uh, how to report them. Basically, there are, there are different experimental setups where you have uh, you know, skin cells in culture, where you have uh, uh, mice that you study for their various skin things, that you have uh, synthetic skin equivalents. So there's all these different testing systems um, that people use to investigate various uh, aspects of how things affect the skin and obviously then you measure various outcomes such as uh, protein production by various cells by mRNA uh, production suggestive that um, there will be protein synthesis so they're quite you know they, these are models which apparently well are you know useful in, in their field, but it's probably getting into more detail than we need to. But I guess the, the point is that there are models where you can test these things and uh, some of them were live mouse, live mice, some of them were um, this sort of skin equivalent in culture. Questions to Rosemary. I have to say I'm a total sucker for all those face creams that were on those advertising, <laughs> even though I probably know they never work. Uh, what kind of moisturiser would you recommend people use? <laughs> <laughs> all the patients ask, all the patients ask. What did I say? Sunscreen. Sunscreen is your moisturiser, okay? If you live in Melbourne, it's from the 1st of September till the 30th of April, okay? So sunscreen is preventing, you know, the most common... Uh, thing that damages our skin. So you've basically you've got to find a sunscreen which you can use like a moisturiser. What's the difference between a sunscreen and moisturiser? Well, uh, in terms of the base, none. So a sunscreen uh, is an effective moisturiser, just has the added protection of the uh, UV absorbers and maybe some chemicals that reflect UV. So you find yourself a sunscreen, I uh, can't mention any brands, but uh, something marketed uh, for you know, daily use as a moisturiser with a 30 plus broad spectrum. And a hat. <laughs>